Hello everyone! Uh, there are a lot of games in chess history that could compete uh, for the title of the greatest blunder. And uh, some people say that uh, that uh, Kramnik game against uh, Fritz where he missed uh, mate in one is the greatest blunder ever. Uh, but I actually prefer this game as uh, it's played between humans. Uh, it was played in uh, the 1994 Linares tournament. Uh, this was actually the round before my previous video where uh, Karpov created that immortal game against Veselin Topolov. Uh, this is round 2 and the Karpov has the white pieces against uh, Evgeny Barev. And uh, well, this is, uh, this is quite unimaginable that, that a, almost a 2700 player could, uh, could play <laughs> such a move. Well, it's not unimaginable as uh, the world champion Kramnik uh, did miss mate in 1. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, you'll just have to see the game and uh, I'm interested, uh, what is your favorite blunder? And uh, do, do you think that, uh, that this could be the greatest blunder in chess history? Uh, so, let's see the game. Uh, Karpov already won one game and this is round two. He plays e4, uh, Boreyev goes for e6, d4 and d5, the French defense. Uh, and knight to d2 by Karpov, the Tarash variation. Probably probably avoiding knight c3 and bishop to b4. So instead knight to d2 and we have c5. And the Karpov immediately goes for uh, for the simplification. E captures on d5, E captures on d5 and knight to f3. Uh, knight to f6 by Barev and the bishop to b5 uh, going for even more exchanges and straight into the end game. Uh, bishop to d7, bishop captures on d7 with check, knight captures on d7 and Karpov castles. Uh, bishop to e7, Abarev is preparing to castle, and we have d captures on c5. Uh, bishop, ca uh, sorry, knight captures on c5, and now knight to d4. And, uh, well, okay, maybe castling here would be a bit premature by Barev, as uh, Karpov maybe, maybe could play knight to f5, and this would be a pretty strong square for the knight. Uh, so Barev plays uh, queen to d7, not allowing knight to f5, and Karpov goes uh, knight to f3. Now this square is available for his other knight. Uh, Barev castles and we have bishop to f4. Karpov, Karpov places this bishop on this beautiful diagonal, also he's winning the e5 square. And uh, Barev goes rook f to e8. We have rook to e1 and now Karpov is completely owning this e5 square. Uh, bishop to f8, uh, offering a trade of rooks and we have knight to e5 by Karpov. Uh, Barev has a couple of options here, he can play as his queen is attacked, he can either go queen d8, uh, even queen to c7 is possible as Karpov doesn't really have any good discoveries with the knight. Uh, but Barev plays uh, queen to a4. Uh, and uh, well, uh, Karpov doesn't mind, he plays c3. Now, uh, protecting his knight on d4 and also offering a trade of queens on d1 because Karpov is saying well, you do have an isolated pawn here on d5, if you want to exchange queens, I will have both my rooks on a nice central squares, and uh, I will, you know, uh, I will play against this d5 pawn, and, uh, well, this is a small advantage, but I'm Karpov, this is this is enough for me. Uh, Barev declines uh, the queen trade, he plays queen to a6, and here if uh, Kasparov played this position, for example, with the white pieces, uh, I'm sure he would go for something like rook to e3, uh, a nice rook lift followed by rook to g3. Uh, but as this is Karpov playing, uh, he goes for queen to e2. Again, offers a trade of queens. And uh, this is this trade of queens is a bit more acceptable for Barev than, than the previous one, as this one doesn't uh, bring uh, Karpov's rook on a1 into the game. So Barev captures the queen. Queen captures on e2, rook captures on e2, and we have bishop to d6. And, well... Uh, Karpov uh, now plays a move, uh, it's, it's a tactic that pretty much uh, transfers the game uh, completely to the end game. Uh, he plays knight to d7, and the move seems a bit weird, as uh, now it seems like Barev can capture Karpov's knight as it's unprotected, and also he can capture Karpov's bishop here on f4, uh, that it's also unprotected. Uh, but not really, if Barev captures the bishop on f4, Karpov captures this knight on uh, c5, and if uh, Barev captures knight, Karpov captures the bishop on d6. So it's uh, simply just a trade of pieces. Uh, bishop captures on f4 by Barev, and knight, uh, sorry, first uh, a trade of rooks, rook captures on e8 with check, rook captures, and now knight captures on c5. Uh, with an attack on this pawn on b7, and if you look at the position, uh, both players have six pawns, and, uh, well, uh, the pieces are the same, only Barev has a bishop against a knight. And, well, Karpov's main, uh, well, 
this bit of an advantage that uh, Barev still has this isolated d pawn. So bishop to c7 uh, and Karpov go plays knight to d3. Barev isn't really worried about Karpov capturing this pawn because if you capture it, rook b8 and after knight to c5, rook captures some b2 and this is perfectly fine for black. Black has uh, this beautifully active rook. So after bishop to c7, Karpov instead played knight to d3, uh, bishop to b6, uh, knight to b3, and king to f8. Uh, rook to d1, and uh, Karpov is preparing uh, to, to create some sort of an attack against this uh, d5 pawn. Uh, we have a5, and now it seems that uh, Karpov can play, for example, knight to f4, and uh, well, pile up on this uh, isolated d pawn. Uh, but this wouldn't really be a good move, because if knight a4, uh, Barev uh, prepared this a4 move. And after knight to d2, uh, you get knight g4 now, with an, uh, with an attack on this f2 pawn, and uh, this position is, uh, is, is much better for black. Uh, so after a5, uh, Karpov decided to play king to f1. Now. His, this pawn isn't pinned anymore, he can uh, push it to f3 to, you know, uh, restrict this knight on f6. Uh, rook to c8, and we have knight to d2. a4, uh, now a3, because Barev uh, was threatening to push a3 himself to undermine the c3 pawn. So a3 by Karpov, and g5. Uh, expanding on the king side, also maybe limiting this uh, the movement of this knight on d3. Uh, knight to f3, attacking the g5 pawn, and we have g4, now kicking the knight away. Knight to h4 by Karpov, and uh, Karpov will now have this uh, strong f5 square for his knight. Uh, but uh, by gaining this, he allowed black to push d4, and now black is getting rid of his uh, isolated pawn, and this, well, doesn't, doesn't look like something Karpov would allow. But okay, c captures on d4, bishop captures on d4, and knight to f5. Now the knight is uh, controlling, placed on this beautiful f5 square. Uh, black has a dark square bishop, so he can't really kick it away from there. Uh, it's uh, well, if Karpov thought that this was compensating, I believe Karpov. Uh, bishop to b6, getting the bishop out of the way, and knight to b4. And this knight is also placed very nicely, as this rook on the c-file uh, is unable to infiltrate white's position. Knight is guarding c2, pawn is guarding c3, rook is guarding c1. So it's a pretty nice position for uh, a square for the knight. Uh, knight to e4, Barev now attacks this f2 pawn. And, well, this was uh, something Karpov had planned, uh, that's why the king moved from g1 to f1. Uh, now Karpov has this f3 move. And, uh, well... Uh, this, uh, this well, has has its upsides and also its downsides. Uh, the upside is that after G captures on F3 and G captures on F3, uh, Karpov kicks this knight uh, away from a nice central square. Uh, but the downside is that, uh, well, now the position is uh, both players have uh, isolated uh, F and H pawn on the king side, and both players have two pawns on the king side. So this is pretty much, uh, pretty much a drawn endgame. Uh, knight to c5, and we have h4 by Karpov. Uh, we have rook to d8, uh, Barev offers a trade of rooks, and uh, Karpov plays rook to d5. And it, it, it's in this position that, that the drama begins, this is the shocker, as, uh, well, uh, it, like I said, it's a, it's a pretty drawn endgame. Uh, Barev can simply capture this rook, and he has a bishop against a knight, and it's uh, the game is played on both sides of the board. Uh, he can't lose this. He can, well, if Karpov doesn't play the best moves, he can maybe even win this. Uh, but Barev plays, uh, which I consider to be the greatest blunder ever played in, in a top G GM game. Uh, he plays a bishop to a7. And, well, uh, only a few seconds pass, uh, Karpov grabs his rook and plays a rook captures on d8 with checkmate. Uh, this is completely overlooking this rook on d8, and, uh, well, this was a classical game, it was, uh, you know, a, a normal time form, it wasn't a blitz or anything. Uh, the knight is covering e7 and g7, the king can't go anywhere, it's game over. And it's really, it's really hard to imagine how a almost 2700 player could, could make a move like bishop to a7. Uh, so some people say that uh, some people say that Barev 
uh, probably already played uh, in his mind rook captures uh, on d5 knight captures on d5 and then uh, bishop to a7 he thought that this uh, trade of rooks already happened on the board and <laughs> he was uh, uh, probably why he played uh, bishop to a7 it's uh, i don't know but uh, this didn't happen on the board on the board he played bishop a7 and karpov checkmated his opponent uh, with rook captures on d8 checkmate so yeah uh, I, I'm interested, uh, how do you like this game? I mean, uh, uh, do you consider this to be the greatest blunder ever? And uh, do you think it, it's, it's, uh, it's a bigger blunder than what uh, Kramnik uh, played against uh, Fritz? And uh, may maybe you have a third uh, or a fourth or a fifth option uh, that you would uh, make a candidate for the greatest blunder ever. So yeah, uh, that's the game. This is round two of the 1994 Linares tournament. In the next round, uh, Karpov will uh, create his immortal game against Veselin Topalov. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Uh, one of them will be Karpov's uh, immortal game against Veselin Topalov, so you can check it out uh, if you haven't. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Samuel Kowalski, Liam Fields, uh, Ben Shapiro, and Eric Simonelli for a contribution to my channel. Uh, thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, I will see you soon.